Good morning and welcome to worship here at Earl Street Baptist Church. We're so glad you've chosen to join us again this morning. Today, we're continuing our fall sermon series entitled, You Are Here. Stephen is bringing our message this morning and the title of his sermon is, You Are Here Singing. We want to remind you that tonight we'll be having our final outside worship service on the campus of Paris View Baptist Church. We've had some wonderful outside services there over the past couple of months, but tonight will be the final service at 6.30, and we hope you'll plan to join us. And then we are so excited about the opportunity to begin regathering for in-person, on-campus worship starting next Sunday, October the 4th. I've got some important information to give you regarding that this morning. Number one, starting next Sunday, our worship service times will be at 9 o'clock, and 11 o'clock a.m. At this time, as we begin to regather, there will be no childcare available. We do plan to offer childcare later this fall, but at this point in time, everyone will go into the worship services together. Number two, bring your mask with you when you come to worship. Mask will be required for everyone in the second grade and older. So make sure you have your mask ready to put on as you enter the building and then make sure you keep it on the entire time you are in the building. Number three, come to the Welcome Center to enter next Sunday morning. When you park, make your way to the covered drive through and plan to come in the Welcome Center doors as that will be the main entrance for everyone starting next Sunday. Number four, because we're observing social distancing guidelines, the seating capacity in our sanctuary is reduced. So, in addition to seating in the sanctuary, there'll be seating available in the fellowship hall, as well as in room 300. Now to help us better manage the number of people in each worship service and in each location, we're gonna be employing a registration system. The registration system will allow you to go out each week, starting on the Wednesday before the Sunday worship service and choose the worship time and location that best suits you. The use of the registration system will allow us to know how many people to expect at each worship service, and it will allow you to know that there is seating available at the worship time and location that you desire. Number five, if you're unable to be with us on Sunday mornings in person, or perhaps you're just not ready to come back for in-person worship, you can still join us for worship on Sunday mornings. Starting next Sunday morning, October the 4th, we'll be live streaming our worship services at both 9 and 11 via our church's YouTube channel. So no matter where you are, you can worship with us on Sunday mornings. We are so excited about everything that's going to be happening and taking place starting next Sunday, October the 4th. And we want you to know and be prepared for what to expect. So if you've got any questions at all, please feel free to call the church office or one of the staff ministers and we will be happy to help you. Now, as we move into our time of worship together, we want to welcome you again to worship here at Earl Street Baptist Church and tell you how very glad we are that you are here.
I hear the sweet, though far off hymn that hails the new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear the music ringing. It finds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from God, we confess that our experiences of suffering make us doubt your promise and power. Like those captive in Babylon, we see no reason and no way to sing your praise. In the depth of our darkness, we do not see your light. In our isolation, we do not feel your nearness. Forgive us, for you gave up your own son for us. You never promised us a world without suffering, but you promised us you would bear us through it. And so we will find a way to sing. What though my joys and comforts die, my Savior still is living. What though the shadows gather round, a new song Christ is giving. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? worshiping this morning with your family. So these last few weeks, we have been talking a lot about being here. We've talked about being here and not in our past and not in our futures and even about being here when we don't really like what here looks like. 
Can you think of a time that you didn't really like what your hair looked like? Maybe it's right now. Well, we see that the people of God, they didn't always like what their hair looked like either. And the people of Judah, who we've been talking about recently, who have been forced out of their homes and taken to this new place called Babylon, things in their lives were not the same as they were before, and they weren't big fans of it. For a while, they had nowhere to call home. And I am sure they were wondering where God was and what he was doing in all of that. They were feeling confused and wondering why God had allowed all of that to happen to them. They wondered why things couldn't be like they used to be. And on top of all of that, in these uncertain and confusing times when they had all those questions, the people who had caused all of that to happen to them, they asked them to sing to God like they did before. You know, back when things were really great and good. But the people of Judah did not know how to sing in this new place. They did not feel as though they had anything to sing about. And I think the same can sometimes be true for us. We may not like where we are right now. We may not understand what is happening or where God is in all of this. We may not like having to stay home more and not getting to spend as much time with our friends. Um, having to do schoolwork at home. We may not like wearing masks or getting to come and spend time with our church family like we used to. But I can assure you that God is with you. He may be telling us we have to stay in this weird time a little bit longer than we would like to, but he's also telling us that he is going to take care of us and that he has big plans for us. He's telling us that he will not leave us. Boys and girls, I want you to know that wherever you are and however you're feeling about it, God is there too, and he loves you. And that, boys and girls, is something that we can always sing about, even on our very worst of days. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this church and its precious and beautiful children. Help us to remember that wherever we are, you are there with us, loving us, and taking care of us. And because of that, remind us that we always, always have something to sing about. Amen. Please join me as we go to the Lord together as a family in prayer. Our loving and gracious and merciful God, from whom all blessings flow. We come before you and together with you this morning, first and foremost, to worship you. We praise you for your mercies, for your goodness that has created us, your grace that has sustained us, your discipline that has corrected us, your patience that has borne with us, and your love that has redeemed us. We thank you for your creation, for the joy of living and the beauty of this day. We thank you for the changing seasons, which remind us of your creative power, and at the same time remind us that you never change. Even as the winds of change howl around us, you are steady and sure and dependable and always working for our good. In the midst of our worship this morning, we lift up our needs and concerns because we know you care about us and you want to hear from us just as we want to hear from you. We especially remember today the families of Edith Sumner and Charlie Carnes who are now at home with you. Thank you for the time that we shared with them as brothers and sisters and thank you for the blessed hope of their and our eternal life with you. We also ask for your particular blessings on our church family as we prepare to regather in your house. As we make decisions and plans and preparations, keep us focused on you and keep us aligned with your will and your ways. Please use all of your power and guidance to keep us moving in the right direction. Surround us with your grace and mercy and wisdom. We need your leadership and your love. 
In all that we do, let the joy outweigh the frustration. Help us to do things in a way that glorifies you and demonstrates to the world that your love can transcend all of our differences and divisions. Indeed, let us be a light to the world. Let us show our community what it looks like to let the love of Jesus shine so brightly through us that it dispels the darkness around us. Help us to see ourselves and each other through the eyes of Jesus. Give us the courage and energy to love without walls and without restraint, even when it means we might have to give up something or be inconvenienced. Help us in humility to value others above ourselves, not looking to our own interests, but to the interests of others. Help us to have the same mindset as Jesus, the one who gave up his status and his rights and his very life to set us free. It is in his precious name that we offer this prayer and all of our worship today and every day. Amen.
If you have been paying attention in recent weeks, you might have realized that we have made several references to The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz has been my favorite movie since I was a child and still is. And the story behind it, as we have seen in recent weeks, has striking parallels to the situation in which we find ourselves today. I can't tell you how many times over the past few months I have thought to myself or even said out loud, we are not in Kansas anymore. We might wish we were back in Kansas, but we are not. We are here. One of the striking things about Dorothy's journey in that movie was that she and her companions sang along the way. Somehow singing just helped to make the journey easier and made the yellow brick road seem even brighter. No matter how dark and how frightening her life became, Dorothy kept singing. And in fact, she sang all the way home. Of course, the difference between Dorothy and us is that we do not live in a dream world. Now, sometimes our lives may seem like a bad dream, but the world in which we live is very real. As Don Kirkland has said many times, the situation we are facing at any given moment is not an interruption to our lives. It is our life. Reality check, we are here, this is life, and there are no magical slippers that we can click together to make everything right or to get everything back to normal again. Have you ever had an experience in your life where there was nowhere you could call home? Perhaps you are going through that kind of experience now. Or, or maybe you were still at home, but home itself was just not the same anymore. Do you ever find yourself in a situation in which you wonder where God is and what God is doing and why God has allowed certain things to happen and why God did not help you then the way you thought God should help you or why God is not intervening now to help you in the way that you believe you need help? Do you ever find yourself remembering the good old days and longing for their return? Whether you are still at home and, or things are just not the same anymore or you have been forced to leave the familiarity and security of your home, the reality is that you are here now. And it is understandable if you feel some anger or even some bitterness, it's understandable if you feel resentful or confused or depressed or discouraged. Those are human emotions. And one of the things I love most about the Bible is that the Bible does not sugarcoat the human experience as we will see in our scripture today. The Bible has a word a word that conjures up all of those images and feelings that I have described. And it is the word exile. And you don't have to be in a foreign land to be there either. It's possible to be in exile in your own home. Because exile is wherever you happen to be when you feel abandoned. Exile is feeling cut off from the past and everything you hold dear. Exile is dreading an unknown future. Exile is that time in your life when God seems to be silent, maybe even absent, or even worse, unconcerned and uninvolved in our lives. Because nothing, nothing makes sense when you are in exile. Exile is facing up to the stark reality that some of the dreams which have propelled us for so long might never be fulfilled. One of the darkest and most dreadful times in the history of God's people was that period of time in the 6th century B.C. known as the Babylonian exile. It's the time when the Babylonians, with the help and encouragement of the Edomites, destroyed the temple and the holy city of Jerusalem. 
Some of Judah's peasants were left in the land of Judah to mourn the destruction of all that was sacred to them, while the more affluent and productive citizens of Judah were taken by the Babylonians against their will into exile to a place that was distant and foreign to them in every way. It's hard to know which would have been worse, to be in exile at home or to be in exile in a foreign land. The scripture passages we will read today help us get in touch with the emotional intensity of the people who were left in Judah and those who were taken away into captivity. The first passage of scripture is from Lamentations chapter 1. The poet of Lamentations was looking at the devastation and destruction that surrounded him from the standpoint of those who were left in Judah amid the ruins of the destruction. The tone of the opening poem in chapter 1 of Lamentations is utter sorrow, hence the name Lamentations. It is a lament in the purest sense of that word. Because where do you even start to rebuild a life that has literally been reduced to ashes? What words do you use to describe the intensity of your sorrow? There's nothing to do but just grieve the loss. Now it is true that they were at least still in their homeland, but life was never ever going to be the same again for them. So I want you to hear these words from the book of Lamentations. Hear these lamentations of the poet beginning in chapter 1 verse 1. How deserted lies the city once so full of people. How like a widow is she who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. After affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed festivals. All her gateways are desolate. Her priests groan. Her young women grieve, and she is in bitter anguish. Her foes have become her masters. Her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile, captive before the foe. All the splendor has departed from daughter Zion. Her princes are like deer that find no pasture. In weakness they have fled before the pursuer. Those are some dark and dismal words. The poet of Psalm 137 was looking at the same experience, the experience of the exile, from the standpoint of those who had been taken into captivity in Babylon. Hear these words from Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplar trees we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs and our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. 
Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Wow. It's hard to believe that even this can be God's word to us today. These words of scripture that are so troubling and so unsettling give us such a brutally honest picture of how human emotion can degenerate when we get into these times of exile. The people there in Babylon were forced to learn a new language, adopt to, adapt to a new culture, and adjust to a whole new way of life. Haunted by the memories of their tragedy, stripped of their dignity, and ridiculed by the taunts of their captors, they wept until they could weep no more. But soon their sorrow turned to anger and their tears to rage. Isn't that what happens when our human emotions degenerate? Their frustration soon turned into violent hatred and their grief into bitterness. They became bitter people. Why can't things be like they used to be? People of God wept as they recalled the time not too long ago when Jerusalem was this thriving center of religion and now it lay in ruins. They remembered the splendor and the glory of the temple, the house of God, the unique place of God's presence and now it had been reduced to a pile of rock. They had been uprooted from the very land which God had given to them and had been taken as hostages to Babylon in a foreign land. And the harps, those harps that they once played in temple worship were now just hung on the poplar trees in Babylon as vivid, song, vivid reminders of the songs they used to sing. And as if their grief were not intense enough, they were given no privacy. They could not even mourn in peace. Their cruel captors made sport of their grief, demanding that they sing one of their songs now. Let's hear you sing one of those songs you used to sing in the temple, their captors jeered. Let's hear your music now. The cruel demands of their captors drove the iron even deeper into their sad hearts because the mere thought of one of those special songs reminded them of the splendor and beauty and security of the Jerusalem temple which now lay in ruins. You know, that kind of ridicule, that kind of taunting by your enemies can quickly turn sorrow into rage. How could they sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How could they be expected to pick up those harps again and sing the songs they used to sing under these circumstances? They had no heart for music or song. And the last thing in the world they felt like doing was singing one of those songs now. To sing one of those songs now would be more painful than joyful. This psalmist would have rather died than give his captors the pleasure of hearing him sing the Lord's song. This psalm is very dark and dismal and troubling and unsettling. It is a brutally frank picture of human nature, how quickly our human emotions can degenerate if left unchecked. 
This is a sober and somber reminder to us of how important it is to control our emotions before our emotions begin to control us. The more we think about and dwell on our tragedies and sorrow, which is a choice we make, the more we choose to think about all that is wrong, the more intense and destructive our emotions can become and the more bitter we become as human beings. What starts out as innocent tears of grief can end up as curses of vengeance as they did for this psalmist. Very sadly, this psalmist, as far as we know, never reached a point at which he could put the past behind him. In fact... That's just a problem that many of us have. The past often has a way of paralyzing us. Because metaphorically speaking, there are harps hanging on every tree, everywhere we turn. There are stark reminders of the way things used to be. Stark reminders, painful reminders of the hopes and dreams that have been shattered and of the new realities that will never go away. But throughout this pandemic, the words of my mother keep coming back to me. Honey, it may not be the same again, but it can still be good. And the reason she could say that with such confidence is because we worship and serve a God who transcends geography and culture and circumstances. Even in exile, God still gives us a song to sing. And by faith, we can, and by God's grace, we will sing that song together all the way home. Now, I know that some would say this is just denial. This is just self-deception. This is just a bunch of positive thinking, mental gymnastics. This is just talking ourselves into believing that things are not really as bad as they seem. This is just making the best of a bad situation. This is just whistling or singing in the dark. But if exile teaches us anything at all, it teaches us that God really is present even in our agony and grief. God is actively involved even in the darkness of our lives to accomplish things we cannot see right now. Exile reminds us that sometimes God does less than we hope, but God is always doing more than we know. God gives us a song to sing, even in exile. And you know, that's what Dorothy and her companions did. Despite all of their displacement and danger, despite all of their confusion and grief, she and her companions just kept singing, kept singing together, trusting that the yellow brick road they were traveling together would one day somehow lead them all the way home. And along the way, Dorothy learned what some of us are still learning, and that is that home is not ultimately about a place. Home is about a face. When Dorothy was away from home, the one picture she could not get out of her mind was the picture of Auntie M's face. And the one sound she could not get out of her mind was the sound of Auntie M's voice calling out for her. Dorothy never got so far away from home that she could not still see that face, if only through a glass darkly. 
and that voice calling her by name, even if only a whisper. And it was that face, that assurance of that presence that enabled her to sing all the way home. In the wake of the outbreak of the coronavirus, the experts, of course, are advising against public singing. They're saying that public singing is one of the most dangerous things we can do right now. And those of us who worship together and sing together as choirs and as congregations are in grief about that. But here's the reality, that there is no virus that can take away the song in our hearts. In fact, one of the things I've noticed about myself over the last few months is that I am singing now more than ever. I'm not singing publicly, but in my heart and sometimes out loud, I don't know, maybe it's just the loss of congregational and choral singing that has made me more determined than ever to keep singing the, Lord, the Lord's song, even in this foreign land. I sing in my car, I sing in my home, I sing when I'm in the neighborhood walking. Wherever I am, I find myself singing and I find myself more determined than ever before to keep the Lord's song alive in my heart. Because even in exile, God gives us a song to sing and a reason to sing it. And by God's grace, we will keep singing the Lord's song somehow, some way, all the way home. Amen. Sometimes Alleluia Sometimes praise the Lord Sometimes gently singing Our hearts in one accord Oh, let us lift our voices Look toward the sky and start to sing Oh, let us now Just let our voices ring. Oh, let us feel His presence. Let the sound of praises fill the air. Oh, let us sing the song of Jesus Christ. this 
Now may the Lord give us all a song to sing, a reason to sing it, and the strength to sing it all the way home. Today, in response to the word that has been sung, read, and preached, I invite you to give as much of yourself as you know how to as much of Jesus as you can understand. In His name, I encourage you to trust Jesus as your Savior and to follow Him as your Lord. Or perhaps today you're being led to deepen your relationship with Jesus, to recommit your life to His Lordship. Or you may be drawn to our church family and would like to find out more about how to join our church. I would love to have the opportunity to talk with you and pray with you about the next step in your journey of faith. Please feel free to contact me at the number or email address printed on the screen. I look forward to hearing from you soon. <music> 